Um, good morning uh, and welcome to the fifth meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. I can remind everybody present um, to switch off their mobile phones, at least put them into a mode that won't interfere with our proceedings. The first item on the agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Scottish Fiscal Commission's revised forecasts, which were produced following policy changes announced last week at stage one of the Budget Bill. We're joined for this session by Professor Alistair Smith, one of the Commissioners, David Wilson, who's also a Commissioner, John Ireland, the Chief Executive, and David Stone, who's the Head of Economic and Income Tax Forecasting. Uh, I warmly welcome our witnesses to the meeting. And Professor Alistair Smith, I think you want to make a short opening statement. Yes, uh, th thank you. Uh, good morning. We're, we're grateful to have this opportunity to, here this morning to discuss our updated income tax forecasts following last week's Stage 1 debate. Uh, as, as you said, during that debate, the Cabinet Secretary announced a number of changes to the Budget Bill that had been based on the draft budget published in December. These changes included a reduction to the high rate threshold for income tax, an extension of the Government's public sector pay policy, and a number of additional expenditure commitments totalling £137.8 million in 2018-19. Last Wednesday, the Scottish Government also published their provisional estimate of the additional revenue of around £220 million in 2018-19 from the income tax policy. That's the income tax policy in its entirety. This includes an additional £55 million, uh, which is associated with the reduction in the higher rate threshold. Uh, the Government noted that the Commission would provide the official revenue estimate, and that's what we did yesterday afternoon when we published a supplement to our December forecast. Uh, this timing was agreed with Parliament and the Government before Christmas. Uh, the written agreement was published on our website. Uh, the Government's final income tax policy is forecast by the Commission to raise £219 million in 2018-19, uh, and that's £55 million more than the policy announced in December. In addition, the extension of the government's public sector pay policy is forecast to raise a further £7 million in income tax revenues. We've been told that the Cabinet Secretary intends to put it on the record at Stage 2 that this additional spending will be funded from tax revenues plus a combination of Scottish Reserve, Scotland Reserve drawdown and underspends. The government does not intend that the additional expenditure announced by the Cabinet Secretary will require additional borrowing or impact on the position of the non-domestic rates rating accounts, which is also known as the NDR pool. Uh, in the light of this announcement, we see no need to change our December assessment of the reasonableness of the Government's borrowing plans. Uh, our next forecast will be published in the spring to accompany the proposed medium-term financial strategy, focusing on the long, longer-term sustainability of Scotland's public finances. And in May, we will review both our assessment of the reasonableness of the government's borrowing projections and its scope. So that's, Mr Chairman, is all I want to say by way of introduction, and we look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Smith. That was a very helpful introduction. And can I say, I, I think we're also very grateful for the Fiscal Commission's ability to turn round so quickly um, that you're forecasting, given it was only last week that we, the, you know, the Budget Bill one, Stage 1 was arrived at. Um, your report, though, suggests that the extension to the public sector pay awards of 3% for those earning more than £30,000 per annum to those uh, earning less than 36,500 in future is expected to generate an additional £7 million of tax revenues in 18-19, rising to £8 million per annum in tw by 22-23. Can you explain to the committee how you arrived at that figure of £7 million? Can I suggest we ask David Stone to talk you through the, the detailed modelling on that? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, so our starting point for these forecasts is the survey of personal incomes, it's detailed income taxpayer data sets. Um, it allows us to identify individuals who we think are working in the public sector. Um, we take the uh, detail of the government's extension to the public sector pay policy um, and using information provided to us by the government, work out the number of people who are in the scope of that 3% pay award and the number of people in the scope of that 2% pay award. 
We then have a specific adjustment for public sector pay in our income tax model. So we, um, using in the information that we were given, we saw that in 2018-19, uh, before the extension, public sector pay would have increased by an average of 3.2%. With the extension, that average increase is now 3.3%. Running those two numbers through the model and seeing what the difference is gives us that 7 million figure. So we increased the total amount of income tax liabilities in 2018-19 by that 7 million pounds difference introduced by 3.3% growth versus 3.2% growth. Unwrap how you identify what, what you mean by public sector. Does that, for instance, does that include people in local government or those, but those parts of the public sector which are not under the direct control of Scottish ministers? Or is it, or is it the public sector as a whole that you identify? So we have to use the data that we've got, which is the survey of personal incomes. This allows us, this has a broad sector, sectoral classification for each individual in that database, uh, which can be things like healthcare worker, education, uh, you know, finance. So we look at those list of sectors and work out for which sectors there'll be primarily public sector workers or primarily private sector workers. So that gives us our breakdown in our, our data set between public and private sector. For those sectors in the model that we identify as being primarily public sector workers, that's what we apply the public sector wage growth rates to, which we work out in a separate exercise based on the information the government gives us. Uh, okay, can delve a wee bit deeper onto that then, because if, if, if we're then looking at the public sector, uh, and, and obviously this issue of the public sector pay award rising up to, up to 3% for those earning less than 36,500 can only really affect the core bits of the Scottish Government which they're responsible for. Yes. So how do you how do you account for the difference between that core group and the others in the public sector, or, or is it a or so how do you deal with it methodologically? Is what I'm really asking. So in a sense, the 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 government is very clear about who their pay policy covers, and you were asking about local government, and it doesn't cover local government apart from teachers. So we use that information that the government gives us on the scope, and we can therefore sort of make an, an appropriate sort of estimate of the size of the coverage of the pay policy. Right. P Patrick, do you want to follow um, up on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure I, I quite followed the answer to, to Bruce Crawford's supplementary there. Are, are you saying that you have made a judgment on who is directly covered in the Scottish Government's pay policy and that the £7 million projection of additional income tax revenue is about those people directly covered by the SG pay policy? Yes, that's correct. And so if we then assume that local government uh, achieves uh, a similar pay policy or perhaps even something better, uh, that would again generate additional income tax revenues on top of that £7 million. Yeah, we, we didn't include them to be in scope okay. for this. That's, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, I was going to go on to ask about the, the process that's gone over the last few days and the protocol. Well, well let's, let's go on to behaviour stuff first before okay. we get there, Patrick. Let's try and get through all the, okay. the issues about the numbers and then we can right talk on. about process. Alexander? Thank you, Convener. Um, I was really just a quick question. Were you uh, surprised on, on behavioural response? Yeah, uh, what your feeling was about the uh, fact that the 56, uh, the, the cost of it is, is almost 20% of the additional amount raised, uh, and whether there was an anomaly between uh, the decreases in, in the, uh, from behavioural responses in the top two rates uh, compared to when you say that the number of people uh, uh, the numbers of taxpayers in those right rates are going to increase over the next five years. Is there an anomaly in that that you've got um, uh, whatever revenue reducing on that, but numbers in people increasing? And I just wondered how much, the final bit of that was how much uh, in the response can be broken down into people uh, managing their affairs differently but remaining within Scotland, and how many people are actually leaving Scotland because of that? I, I think um, <coughs> some key things to emphasise in this, the, the approach we've taken to costing the, the changed or the, the new approach by the government announced at stage one is exactly the same as the approach that we took back in December. So it's the same o o overall approach. I think the, um, you know, as you put it, the, uh, you know, it may it may look um, as though the behavioural impact on this change in policy is much less than the behavioural impact on the, the initial policy announced. 
um, you know, back in December, and that, that reflects the, the, the particular na nature of the, the announcement. I mean, what, what our overall approach recognises is when there is a change, for example, to the additional rate for, um, for very high uh, you know, ta tax payers, then that's likely to something that will both uh, be an incentive to adjust tax affairs and for many, for many people who may have the ability to do it. And that is, that is reflected in the modelling approach we, we, we've taken that uh, leads to the, the, the reduction in the, between the static, as we call it, uh, um, impact and, and taking into account a behavioural impact. The, what we've, in terms of the new proposal um, and the adjustment in the personal allowance, I mean, that, that will affect a large number of people, but it will affect a large number of people in a relatively limited way. On the government's numbers, it will, in effect, increase the tax payment um, by around about the sort of £170 figure. Uh, and we wouldn't expect that to have a, a very significant behavioural impact compared to the, you know, the, the initial proposal. So the, the incremental... Uh, behavioural impact of this new proposal over what was uh, announced in, in December, we would expect to be more modest based on the assessment that we've made. Your question, Ms. Haley, as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and yeah, I'd like to just touch on something on, on the behavioural stuff very briefly, and also if I may uh, just follow up on this issue about the uh, local government, because I think there's maybe some clarity on that as well in the wider public pay impact. Um, so it, uh, thanks very much for, for coming along and thanks very much for the, the work you've done on this. It's been uh, excellent. Just to clarify, I'm looking at table 10 and if I understand this correct, what you're saying there is that you would have expected on the static cost and with the changes that have just been made by the government, um, the, the, the recent changes on the threshold to raise 61, but 5 million of that you're losing because of behavioural impact, so it's something less than 10 per cent, is that correct? And, and just again clarify the point that was made earlier, the reason for that being lower than you saw before is because it hits a number of people that are in that 43 to 44 range, but they are most likely people that aren't in a position to be able to change their affairs dramatically. And it hits a lot of other people, but it hits them to such a small degree you don't expect it to drive any change in their behaviour. Is that correct? And I think it, it, it hits them to, uh, to a, a fixed amount. Yeah. Um, it's not um, for somebody earning, um, a, say, for example, over £150,000, um, even if they uh, reduced their amount, you know, time worked, or if they slightly adjust affairs, the, the maximum that they could could save would be limited. So it, it, it's the difference between a, a, an average tax and a marginal tax. Um, that So in this one, we wouldn't expect the uh, behavioural impact to be anything like as great as, for example, a change to the additional rate of tax. Okay, and have you done that using the numbers you gave us before for the ties, it's, which it's is 0.35 up to 0.75? Same approach, the same, same model. Okay. Thanks very much for clarifying that. Um, and just very briefly, following up on the point that, that, that the convener and Patrick Harvey were asking, if your assumption of 7 million only applies to Scottish Government employees, then if you look at the broader public sector, I think you said teachers were included in that, but, but not others. Um, if you apply that right across the piece and if local government and others gave the, the, that, those increases as well, could you quantify how much extra that would raise over and above the 7 million? So if we just the, um, we got advice from the government on who would be in scope of this policy and they also told us who they believe would be aligned with this policy and they told us that would include around 260,000 public sector workers. Um, and that would include NHS, police, fire and teachers. It's up to the government to clarify exactly who the pay award will cover, but that's the advice that we received. So it's around 260 public sector workers in Scotland out of a total, I, I can't remember the total number, but you know, four or 500,000 odd. So it applies to a fair chunk of all individuals in the public sector. And then we break down the increases in pay for that group. But based on what you've just said, it sounds like it applies to roughly half. Yeah, but it doesn't apply to the local government. They're excluded from that 260,000 figure. Correct. So. Um, that seven million will become a number that, that maybe double that. I'm just trying to see if you can quantify that number for us in any way, shape, or form. We we haven't done that right. quantification okay. um, because it, it says it's not a stated government policy. Okay. That okay, no, that's that, that's government, clear. But right. the, the orders of magnitudes that you're talking about, are if if all local government employees mm. were to receive. 
that sort of level of web audits, you know, that those order of magnitude numbers, but that's not a quantification that we've that's, that's clear. So it could be double, give or take. Okay, that's clear. Thank you very much. But Thank that you. whole process becomes even more difficult to make a judgment on because of the number of UK civil servants who are employed in Scotland and we don't know yet where they will be in terms of the final pay position. So they might not achieve the same levels as Scottish government um, directly affected uh, individuals if you're a UK civil servant. And therefore, it's a pretty complicated pr picture at this stage is what I'm really trying to suggest. And, and to be, yes, it's a complicated picture. Um, estimates could be made, but to be clear, it's, it's not an estimate that uh, yeah. we have made or would be within our sort of broad you know, remit to, to make an estimate of. Okay, fair enough. Patrick? Uh, yes, still on uh, the behavioural effects. Um, you stated the greatest behavioural response comes from those in the higher and top rate bands. <laughs> and uh, in discussion with, with Ivan McKee, I think you agreed that there was um, there was likely to be a, a, a larger effect at the, the highest end of the income scale. But you're, you're still saying that the higher rate bands is, is included in this statement that where the greatest effect is. What is the evidence base for the extent of the uh, effect of behavioural changes around tax avoidance at the higher rate band? And, and in particular, I'm thinking about the, the, the bulk of higher rate taxpayers who may be at the bottom end of that range. What is the actual evidence base that you place your assumptions on? I mean, we, we've set out in our um, previous published papers in December, and we published a, an earlier paper on our overall approach to um, to forecasting income taxes. That there, there is an academic literature that sets out um, the the experience of countries and areas that have. Um, in as far as it's possible, comparable, um, you know, variations in, in income tax. Um, but that literature is far from comprehensive or far from definitive in terms of the, the conclusions that you can draw from it. The, the principal source of, um, and also the, or the best example that I think we draw on is the work that's been done by HMRC um, going through the experience of the change to the higher rate of tax in uh, uh, 2010 to 12 in, um, in the UK, where there was a, a, an increase to the 50 pence uh, rate of tax, which was then subsequently removed. Now, that experience uh, has enabled people to assess the likely behavioural uh, impact. And um, HMRC published in March 2012 an assessment of that, which I think has been quite influential in the way people have been thinking about behavioural impacts. And subsequently, the Institute for Fiscal Studies have uh, produced uh, assessments as well. But can I perhaps quote from the HMRC uh, study, which I think is quite, uh, quite, quite informative. I mean, one of the key things they say in their conclusions was that Behavioural, resp behavioural responses to tax changes are often large and highly uncertain. And I think that's our starting point in this, that they, we, we should expect, particularly for higher uh, rate taxpayers, a large behavioural effect, but the precise level of that or the precise uh, impact is inevitably going to be uncertain. And that came out of, of that uh, re research study um, and what they drew from the conclusions of the the assessment of, of that experience was that the, the um, there was quotes considerable behavioral response and a substantial amount of forestalling so what we've attempted to do is take a, take advantage of the work that's already been done um, develop a, an overall approach which we've published and stated what our approach to both behavioural responses through, uh, um, through ta tax income el elasticities and also our assessment of the way we think forestalling would work, dependent on the, the particular uh, policy option, set out our overall approach to it and have evaluated the stated government policy against that, that background. So that, that, that's our overall approach to this. Um, and, and just one final uh, addition, we plan to publish some further information setting out our, uh, you know, deep, more, even more detailed approach to uh, modelling of, of income tax, including behavioural responses, in, in a paper at the, on the 7th of March. We'll publish some further information. That would be very helpful. I, I look forward to that. It, it's going to be a couple of years before we get the reconciliation 
between your projections and, and the reality. Uh, is it going to be earlier than that when we know what the reality is? Are, are you going to be in a position to refine your projections for next year based on information that you'll gather during the, the coming financial year about the amount of tax revenue that's being generated and the amount of tax avoidance behaviour that's taking place? Yeah, I think two things. We, are, we, we will undertake a, a forecast evaluation. We'll assess how, how well we have done or uh, what we have missed you know, on an annual basis, and we'll publish a report set, setting that out. So, yes, we'll do that. And if that suggests adjusting our overall approach or adjusting our elasticities or an assessment, we will, of course, do that and, and, and set, out, set out the reasons why. Um, one element of caution to that is inevitably in looking at the data and the outturns as and when we get them, there will be a time delay. Uh, we won't get the comprehensive detail probably for, you know, it, it, it will not be next year, it may be a subsequent year before we will get the detailed information. Um, and also disentangling the likely behavioural effect from the change in the tax from all the other factors that are going on, whether it's economic change or change, you know, wider change in government policy, will be, it'll be a challenging exercise to do, but we will seek to do it as, in as you know, best we can and we'll set out all the reasons and, and assessment that we make. Thank you. I was going to ask a couple of things beyond behavioural effects. Was there anybody else you wanted to...? Yeah, wanted behavioural stuff. I know, James, you were interested in some, some of that area. Was it, was it more of the process? But It's more of the process. Right. Um, OK, I think we'll, we'll just... We might as well patch it, we just okay. will bash on at this stage. But it just reminds me of what, when you're talking here, what Robert Choate said to this committee about forecasting yeah. and about being like, spot the ball. Probably, and, yes. and somebody is always moving the ball. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so no matter how g good you want to try to make this an exact science, you can't. You're never going to get this right. Yeah. That's, I, thing, that's the reality. It's never going to be bang on. Yeah. So, I'm grateful so for you saying that as well as us. No, it's just, just a reality. <laughs> I think we've all just got to remind, remember ourselves of this when we get so close to the process that this is, you know, you're making best judgments you can on the assum and assumptions based on the information that come in front of you, comes in front of you. But, um, yeah, very reassuring to know that we're all getting it wrong one way or the other by the, by the end of the day. Um, uh, just wanted to ask about thresholds. You, you said that there's an assumption uh, that... Uh, the higher rate threshold will increase by inflation in the absence of any other policy change. Uh, that, that notion of increasing the higher rate threshold by inflation uh, is itself a, a, a policy decision. Uh, I, am I understanding your, your, um, the, 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 the commentary in, in your update report that that is a policy decision the Scottish Government has informed you of uh, and that uh, you you will work on the basis of that because of a decision the government has already made. That's John to give you a, a more specific answer on this, but I think there is a distinction between uh, official stated policy mm. for this year um, and to enable us to undertake five-year forecasts, we have to make an assumption about what what may happen in the future. Um, and we looked to the government to give us an indication of what they think their future approach should be, simply to enable us to do the assessment. But I think in terms of status, the, the official stated policy for this year is perhaps of a different mm -hmm. order than uh, the best assumption of what the policy may be going forward. But I don't know if one of my colleagues want to add to that. So uh, we need to make some assumption about what those thresholds are going to be in future years. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to make that assumption as neutral as possible so that we're not introducing policy changes. But I think leaving the thresholds fixed exactly where they are, that, that's not particularly realistic. Uh, we don't have the history in Scotland, but in the UK, those, the, the higher rate threshold has increased over the long term in line with inflation. If there haven't been other policy decisions, the, the statutory indexation in the UK that makes sure that happened. And in this you know, discussion with the government over time, we established that that neutral starting point for where those thresholds are going to end up over the next few years is to increase them in line with inflation, and then you adjust policy around those thresholds on top of that. And could I just add to that to be crystal clear about this, Mr Harvey, that the um, paragraph 11 of our report says, therefore, while not a policy, the gov Scottish government suggested a set of assumptions for further years. So they're very, they've been very clear that they're comfortable with our assumption, but it's not a government policy. So presumably it would be helpful for you if there was a policy intention. For example, if, if it became government policy uh, that year on year tax policy should reduce economic inequality uh, rather than that it should 
continue to give stability. Um, it would be helpful for you if that was a, a stated policy that you can base your, your longer-term assumptions on. I think it's helpful in, in our forecasting that the government is clear as possible about what its future <coughs> policy is, whatever that policy is. OK. Um, I was also going to ask about the process and the protocol. Do you want me to...? Good crack at it. So I think I'll let James okay, come in yeah. on processy stuff first, and then we'll, we'll come back. OK. Um, just in terms of the, the process, obviously you published the report um, after the, the uh, publication of the draft budget, and then the Cabinet Secretary announced changes last week, and you've had to go through, a, a, I guess, an interaction uh, in order to produce this report. Can you maybe just describe the process between um, the announcement in the, the Chamber last week and uh, the subsequent publication of your report? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, after the announcement last week, we were sent a formal notification by the government of the, of the policy, which contained um, the, the description of the policy. It also contained some background information about other aspects of what had happened, including expenditure, um, the expenditure announcement, and also talking a little bit about how the government intended to um, provide the, um, find the money to pay for the additional expenditure. So we received that. Um, we then turned around our costing and sent the government preliminary results of the costing on Friday. On Monday, um, we sent the government um, a near final draft of our report um, for um, fact checking. Um, we offered the government a challenge meeting so they could um, discuss our, our costing with us and with the commissioners. Um, the government thought that they'd had enough conversation with us so they didn't take us up on that opportunity. And yesterday we um, sent another version of the report for fact checking um, by about two o'clock. Two o'clock. Um, and then we had um, a small number of comments back from the government and then we published at three o'clock. Okay, that's um, helpful. Um, just you mentioned the, the the option was offered of a, a challenge meeting, which the government didn't take up. Did that take place before the publication of the first report? Um, the publication of the first report, there were a whole series of challenge meetings. So, if you um, on the the commission's website, we published a, a protocol which described the interaction with the government. So, there are a whole series of challenge meetings at which looking at individual tax and the economic forecast, um, at various points we provided preliminary forecasts to the government. They looked at the assumptions and they came back with what they thought were um, methodological points um, about how we had done our forecasting. So that process is, is, is very clearly explained in the protocol. Okay. Um, on table nine, you know, you, out, you outline a position where um, the, the end behavioural uh, impact uh, is uh, minus £56 million. Pounds. Um, if the government arrived at a position where they disagreed with that after all these discussions and challenge meetings, uh, what uh, are the government able to um, use their own figure or are they legally bound by the figure that you've calculated? The, 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 Sc the Scottish Fiscal Commission Act requires that the government uses our figures, but if they do not wish to use our figures, they need to write, I think, to Mr Crawford and explain why they haven't used the figures. So they have the, they have the ability not to use our forecast figures, but if they do go down that path, they have to write, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, to Mr Crawford and explain why they've made that, made that decision. OK. Um, final, final question, convener. Um, if we were to get to a position where um, the Cabinet Secretary again decided to make a change in terms of tax policy, say um, the weekend before the rate resolution debate on the 20th of February, um, how would that, you know, how would you be able to deal with that in terms of going through the process that you've just, just described over the last week? So we've had a, um, preliminary discussions with, with, with the government um, about eventualities like that. We, we had those discussions a little earlier in the process, and we have, have, have agreed a rough timetable with them for, for ch any further changes. So if, if I think the, the next obvious point at which it could change is the Scottish rate resolution. Um, and if the government intends to make a change at that point, um, they will need to tell us in advance, and we would go through a similar process. Okay. Right. Okay. 
Uh, Patrick, do you want to follow through on these? Yeah. Any, anything on the process stuff? Thank you. Want thank to? you. I mean, just just briefly. Um, you know, I was I was preparing for. Um, believe it or not, a relatively consensual debate that we had yesterday afternoon about some aspects of the budget process. And I was I was looking at how it used to be done, a six-month budget scrutiny process for what was a much simpler budget in those days. And thinking about that in comparison now with, with this process and, and my reaction when I read the, the protocol about, you know, stage one vote on Wednesday then, uh, notification to the Commission of, of policy changes by Thursday, uh, amendment deadline Friday, then presumably you're working over the weekend on your, your analysis, which comes to government for a potential challenge meeting on Monday morning, followed by deadlines at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock and then 3 o'clock for publication. <coughs> it's a bit of a breakneck process, isn't it? Can't we do anything to improve that and to ensure that we have a calmer reflection on what are non-trivial uh, questions about the, the Scottish finances. I, I, I think the way to think about that is that we, through the process which John described earlier, had a, an extended period of engagement with the government in accordance with the protocol before the December announcements. The, the details of our income tax model are well understood by the government, are, are are, are clearly set out by us. So uh, a, a change in the government's policy announced to us last week can actually be processed through a model which we understand and which the government understands quite quickly. That's, it's, it's not, I, I looked at my colleagues on the left, it, 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 it's not a, it is done speedily and efficiently. I think it wouldn't be fair to say that it's a breakneck process, uh, that the people are working under stress. It's the application of, of an established model to a change in the previously announced policy. I think the really, just to add to what Alistair was saying, I think the really important thing is, is for Santa, taking this recent paper as, as an example, is that we have sufficient time to do quality assurance. And we didn't work over the weekend, I'm, I'm very grateful to say, um, but we, had, we, we made sure that we had sufficient time to do quality assurance and, and in what David and his colleagues were doing during that process was spending an awful lot of time checking the calculations. Um, we, we checked them internally, we checked them against the government analysts because they were using the similar models so we could compare notes with how they had done this work. Um, we also had sort of a, check, a checking process within the Commission that people weren't involved in this work checked the numbers as well. So we're pretty confident the quality assurance process that we have in place and the time we have for that is, is sufficient. To go to your sort of wider point about the budget process, um, as you know, the, the, there was um, a budget process review group um, which worked during the course of last year and produced a report which I think has got a, a number of recommendations, some of those including the work that we're doing and also... Um, moving towards sort of another a second forecast by the Commission in, in late spring, May. Um, and as, those, as we work through and those, those, the, those recommendations are accepted or evolve, I think that's going to change the whole nature of the, of, of, of the process in, in a way which elongates it. Okay, yeah, that's well, helpful. Politicians will get in the road and make last minute decisions. <laughs> to make it difficult for you. So uh, it's actually, the question should be for us, can we make decisions a bit quicker? That would probably be the right way to think about this in, in, the, in the round. But I'm not asking you to comment that because I'm going to go to Murdo Fraser. Oh, thank you. Um, in um, your uh, paper, paragraph 18, you have a uh, calculation of the impact on income tax liabilities. And you come to the conclusion that uh, taxpayers with gross incomes below £26,000 will have a reduction in their tax liabilities up to £20 a year taxpayers with gross incomes above that threshold will have higher tax liabilities. The cut-off point that the Scottish Government have quoted is £33,000 a year, and you're quoting £26,000 a year, so it would be helpful if you could explain uh, why you arrive at the figure of £26,000. Yep, um, so we, when considering the costing, we're comparing uh, what taxpayers would have paid in 2018-19 in our baseline assumptions, so going back to what we discussed before about how we grow the higher rate threshold without any policy change, and we compare that to what happens with the policy change. So when you look at tables 5 and 6 above paragraph 18, it shows that in 2018-19 what the parameters would have been in that year, in 18-19 what they are with the policy change, and that's the comparison we're making. 
and with that comparison, the cutoff point is 26,000. The 33,000 pound figure, I believe, is based on comparing what taxpayers paid in 1718 compared to 1819. So that's where the difference come from. And I think in the Scottish government's income tax, pay, income tax fact sheet that they published, they, they make that distinction as well. They've got both sets of figures there. Okay, thank you. Willie, do you still have questions on forecasting, or has it been exhausted? No, no, I wouldn't mind, Bruce, if okay. that's okay. Um, hello there, I wonder if I could ask you a couple of questions on your five-year forecast, which you've illustrated in Table 12 in your paper. We can see from the figures that your estimate for tax take uh, for the year ahead is £12 billion, but in year five it's around £14 billion. Could you firstly explain why such a significant rise between you know, 12 billion and 14 billion, that's a significant jump in tax take in the five year period. Uh, reasons for that, uh, partly, uh, partly inflation will be impacting on um, an increase in the tax take, So, and, and particularly in the current circumstances that will be a factor in this. Uh, I think there's also the increasing tax take from the public sector pay increases will be a factor. The, um, the in, uh, you know, thirdly, there will be the increasing amount of, of tax received by virtue of the fact that as um, you know, th thresholds change, there's this what 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 it, it, it is, is a you know there will be an increase tax take built into the, the the tax system. So taking a number of factors like that and, and other ones, we'd expect the overall tax take to be increasing. Uh, to, to that degree, but in, inflation is a big factor and a cumulative impact of the decisions that have been made by the Scottish Government this year and last year are contributing uh, to that. Again, perhaps ask John, David, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, yes, so the, we are forecasting economic growth of around 1% a year. That will add to income tax revenues as well. So as people's incomes increase, income tax revenues will increase. Uh, these numbers are in nominal term. They include the impact of inflation. So again, that adds to people's incomes. Uh, so I think that the main driving factors, but the, you know, uh, population growth as well will add to this. Uh, growth in the number of people in employment, there's, there's a lot of factors that will lead to an increase over time. Mm. And could I just ask about margins of error in, in forecasting? I know it's difficult territory to get into, but would you say that you're more kind of on the cautious side or the optimistic side? And as this five-year set of forecasts moves through, are we likely to see a divergence in your estimates compared to perhaps what the, the government of the day might be producing for themselves? Are you more cautious than optimistic? I think as a general matter, our forecasts are, are, cent are central forecasts that are our best estimate of, uh, our, our best forecast of what we think the numbers are going to be. And um, one's, always, one's always careful not to, with the assumptions one makes, but no, they're not, they're not pushed downwards to be deliberately cautious. And on forecast error, um, could I just add that um, I think people are quite used to sort of seeing these fan diagrams which sort of show a a, an opening degree of, of confidence um, in forecasts as they go through time. Because the Fiscal, Mich Fiscal Commission hasn't been producing forecasts, this is our first set of forecasts, we don't have historical forecast errors, so we can't produce those, those fan diagrams. When we have enough forecast um, information about forecast outturn, we will produce those, so you'll get a much clearer sense of the, the, sort of the confidence intervals. At the moment, what we've done, and we did in the December report, report was we produced a number of um, sensitivity analysis, so you can, you can have a look at that back to that December report and get a sense, if you, if you move certain assumptions, what the impact on the, on the income tax forecasts are. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't think anyone else has in, identified themselves as want to ask a question, so can I can actually thank you very much for coming along this morning and providing us with evidence. We're very grateful for that. It's been helpful and provided some clarity. Uh, and at this stage, I conclude and suspend this meeting. Um, for five minutes to uh, change over witnesses. Thank you.
Um, the second item on our agenda today is to take evidence on the Budget Bill at Stage 2. This is intended to allow the Committee the opportunity to put questions on the Bill and amendments to the Cabinet Secretary and officials before we turn to formal proceedings. We are joined for this item today by Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by Scottish Government officials John Nicholson, who is the Deputy Director of Financial Scrutiny and Outcomes, Graham Owenson, the Head of Local Government Finance, Jonathan Sewell, the Head of Income Tax and Tax Strategy Unit. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting uh, and invite the Cabinet Secretary if you wish to make an opening statement. Okay, thank you, Convener. And I'd like to begin by welcoming the Finance and Constitutions Committee's report on the 1819 draft budget. And as I have informed Parliament last week, I'll respond to the report in full in advance of the Stage 3 debate on the 21st of February. Today's committee session will focus on the content of the Budget Bill itself, as approved in principle by the Scottish Parliament. In addition, the following spending changes that I announced at Stage 1 debate last week. There are also a number of amendments to the Bill that the Committee will need to consider. I'd like to begin by focusing on some of the presentational differences that exist between the presentation of the draft budget that I published in December and the Budget Bill that was introduced on the 25th of January and we're considering today. In order to assist the Committee, I'll explain the main differences with reference to Table 1.2 on page 3 of the supporting document. Column H in Table 1.2 sets out the draft budget spending plans restated for the Budget Bill purposes. Columns B to G provide details of the specific adjustments that have been made, including the necessary statutory adjustments to meet the requirements of the parliamentary process. There is only one actual change to the spending plans outlined in the draft budget that I wish to take the opportunity to highlight to the Committee. To ensure that budgets align with the latest available information, there is a decrease of £222.4 million to the AME budget provision for teachers and NHS pension schemes. This reflects HM Treasury update to the, the discount rate applied for post-employment benefits announced on December 2017. The rate changes announced in December are used in preparing budget estimates, but will have no effect on the current contributions paid out of salaries, eh, neither by scheme members nor to current payments made to retirees. A other adjustments set out in Table 1.2 include the exclusion of £165.6 million of NDPB non-cash costs, which do not require parliamentary approval. And these are mainly in relation to the depreciation and impairments for NDPBs. At the exclusion of judicial salaries and Scottish Water Loan repayments to the National Loans Fund and Public Works Loans Bond, which again do not require parliamentary approval. At the inclusion of £5.4 million of police loan charges that need to be approved as part of the Budget Bill. So adjustments to portfolio budgets reflect a requirement that a number of direct funded and external bodies require separate parliamentary approval. These include the National Records of Scotland, Forestry Commission, Food Standards Scotland, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, Scottish Housing Regulator, Revenue Scotland and Teachers and NHS Pension Schemes. The restatement of local authorities' specific grants included in the overall 1819 local government settlement is there to ensure that they are approved and under the control of the appropriate Cabinet Secretary with policy responsibility. Full details of all grants treated in this way are included in the table on page 43 of the supporting document. And these are all the technical adjustments and do not change in any way the budget that has been scrutinised by this and other committees and approved in principle by the Parliament. I would also remind members that for the purposes of the Budget Bill, only spending which scores as capital in the Scottish Government's or direct funding body's annual accounts is shown as capital. So this means that capital grants are shown as operating expenditure on the Budget Bill supporting document. The full capital picture is shown in Table 1.3 on page 4. And now turning to the Stage 2 amendments. The amendments that the Committee is considering today give effect to the changes to spending plans that I announced to Parliament at the Stage 1 debate last week and will be formally moved later in this session. As I announced to Parliament last week, I will be providing a total uplift of £170 million to local government as part of the deal agreed with the Scottish Greens. The amendments that I am proposing today allocate £10.5 million to support inter-island ferries for Orkney and Shetland Isles, an additional £125 million to local government in 1819, with the balance of £34.5 million being allocated in 1718. £2 million uh, for fuel poverty, £200,000 to accelerate the delivery of our four marine protected areas, and I'm making available £70,000 in funding for the Scottish Sports Association. I've also agreed to make available up to £2 million for a local rail development fund, uh, but this is not covered in these amendments as discussions on how that will be taken forward are still ongoing at this time. 
Uh, these commitments will be funded through a combination of around £62 million in expected additional income tax revenues and around £110 million from a combination of anticipated underspend in 1718 and drawdown from the Scotland Reserve. SFC, as you have just been hearing, have forecast that an additional £55 million will arise from the change in the higher rate threshold and a further £7 million of tax revenues due to the change in the pay policy threshold to £36,500. The final mix of underspend and reserve drawdown will be determined at the end of the financial year once there is greater certainty on the year-end financial position. And I hope these introductory remarks have provided the committee with a useful explanation of some of the key aspects of the Budget Bill. I would be happy to now take any questions from members. Thank, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I just want to pick up on one of the themes to begin with that I tried to explore during the Stage 1 report about some of the future challenges we have around the Budget. You'll note from a report, our draft um, report on the draft budget, that we highlight a potential risk to public finances if there's any significant forecast error in future. You've also seen that we're looking for further details from the SFC on why, despite having lower economic growth forecasts per capita relative to the UK, they forecast that the income tax revenues per capita will grow at the same rate in Scotland as the rest of the UK. Given that uncertainty and volatility. Can you provide the committee with some understanding of how the Scottish Government intends to address this challenge and avoid as much as possible that can be done um, any unwelcome surprises that when we eventually get the final outturn data for income tax revenues in September 2020? It's yes. just about what you're planning around that. I think it would be helpful to know about. Yeah, it's a good question, uh, convener, and one that I know would uh, will all be focused on. Um, obviously, we want forecasts to be as robust as possible. I was watching the evidence early, and I think it was Patrick Harvey I, I heard say in terms of economists that, that none of them get it exactly right, such as the nature of forecasts to the, to the penny. Um, but of course, we want the SFC forecast to be as robust as, as possible. Uh, but that said, there's a range of interventions we can make. First of all, there is the uh, reserve to help with smoothing from one year to the next, if that was required. Um, the, 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 you know, the budget is substantial, around £40 billion. Uh, there's obviously flexibility to accommodate some of that. But if the forecast error was in such a scale, um, there are the uh, borrowing powers as part of the fiscal regime as well. If it was at that end of the scale of, of, of substantial and beyond our, our financial means uh, to uh, resolve this. So, um, in your budgeting, uh, managing uh, uh, the issue uh, from one year to the next, uh, the reserve and uh, the overall approach in tax take, recognising that tax take and, of course, the fiscal framework and the methodology we've got is tax to tax. And in that regard, even though GDP growth is not what we would want it to be, um, wage uh, growth in terms of that analysis was, was individually and specifically um, stronger. So range of actions from uh, in-year management, use of reserves, all the tools that we have in the box, but if it was so substantial, then there is provision to borrow if it was at that scale in accordance with the fiscal framework. And do you require Treasury agreement on if it was a, of a scale that the forecasts were so far out? Do you require Treasury agreement to, to, to enter into that process of drawdown from borrowing powers to help smooth it out? Yes, it would have to meet the necessary uh, criteria and, and, and require their engagement, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Adam, I think your question is about transparency. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you agree um, that it is essential for effective parliamentary scrutiny of the budget process that the Scottish Government is as transparent as possible about its budget proposals? Yes. Um, and do the, we haven't had the pleasure yet of your response to our um, uh, report published a couple of weeks ago on the draft um, budget, but you'll see when you look at that report that there are a number of specific recommendations about transparency. Have you had a chance to reflect on those recommendations yet? Yes, and I think it should be taken into account with the overall work around the budget um, process review group as well. So should we consider all of that in the full in terms of process? Yes. Do you think it is compatible with the um, principle of transparency that you said is essential to effective parliamentary scrutiny? Or do you think it is a breach of the principle of transparency, which you have said is essential, for you to produce more than £160 million of additional spending between the publication of the draft 
budget and the actual budget. No, I don't think there's any breach at all. It's a substantial budget. There's obviously flexibility. Last time I appeared before the committee, um, I was asked about what financial resources the government had. And I've repeatedly made the point that areas such as um, budget uh, exchange and carryover uh, can be uh, determined uh, uh, as the process uh, moves and you get to a year end. If you take, what kind of, what kind, take, what, what kind well, of trans- I'm, I'm, I'm making the point, if I may, because it relates to, to this budget, around the Scotland Reserve as well. I've presented that information to Parliament uh, also. And on other matters such as the uh, non-domestic rates, Bill, I've been perfectly clear on what the government's plan is. Um, I was going to ask you about that. Sorry, I thought you'd stopped, but I was going to ask you about the Scotland Reserve. Can you give us a bit of transparency around the Scotland Reserve? What is, what is, what is the size of it? What was the size of it before you made the deal with the Scottish Green Party? What is the size of it, size of it after you've made the deal with the Scottish Green Party? As I've uh, previously reported to Parliament, and I'm sure Adam Tompkins does actually know this, there are years that we contributed to the Scotland Reserve. As a consequence of the fiscal framework, there are parameters around budget exchange from one year to the next. Where we have generated tax revenues, it could go into the Scotland Reserve. That's what I did, to the tune of £74 million reported to Parliament. Uh, that can be uh, deployed now and future uh, years. Of that £74 million, I've described the uh, decisions that we can take around uh, budget exchange. So that's year-end uh, flexibility, the carryover, if you like, and use of Scotland Reserve. And the tax uh, change as well to fund the proposition uh, that will secure the passing of the budget. Um, so at all you know, stages, I've been uh, forthcoming in the financial position of the government. The tax reserve, then, if we were to use you know, a balance uh, of that, there will still be uh, Scotland Reserve uh, resources available for next year. Perhaps the problem that we have is that we have different definitions of transparent, because I don't think that that was a very transparent answer with respect. I asked you what was the size of the Scotland Reserve before you did the deal with the Scottish Green Party, and what will be the size of the Scottish Reserve, Scotland Reserve after you have done the deal with the Scottish Green Party, and you haven't answered either of those questions. Well, I think I have tried to answer the question, but it is around issues such as I've said in the statement, because I think if you listen to what I'm actually saying, the final determination and what is deployed uh, will be determined by what is available in in a budget exchange. So if there is more available for carryover at the end of the year, then we use less of the reserve. As it stands right now on current uh, planning assumptions, we could use about uh, £40 million pounds, uh, of the uh, uh, Scotland uh, reserve. So that would be 40 of the 74. But that position may change as a consequence of what might be available in budget carryover. And in the interest of transparency, that figure is annually reported to Parliament uh, in terms of the reserve uh, and uh, any underspend that may arise. Uh, normally in the June out- outturn, which is what I've done since becoming Finance Secretary, in a very open and transparent way. James, a supplementary. Okay, um, thank, thank you, convener. Um, in terms of the, the money being drawn from the, the underspend in the Scotland Reserve, that's £110 million. And this is a similar situation to last year, where there was £120 million drawn down from that. Is it not the case that what, in effect, you're doing is you've got that block of money set, set aside there, almost as a kind of slush fund for your negotiations as part of the parliamentary process? I wouldn't describe it as that, Mr Kelly. I mean, you, you can term it any way you want. What happened uh, in previous years, of course, was any underspend at the end of the year might have been carried over and used through the course of the year. If you want to be fully transparent, I don't think it's a bad thing to set out what that underspend might be and how the government proposes to use it. And in fact, if it's using in a, in a way that's uh, agreeing parliamentary support. I actually think that's quite a good thing, <clears throat> and I'm sure uh, Mr Kelly would welcome that, and I think it's far more credible than the plans I've seen from the opposition Labour Party on how to fund a budget. Uh, but I think it's a uh, very prudent, wise and transparent use uh, of a uh, resource. The only thing that's fluid at this stage, and that's the point I was trying to make, is how much exactly is available at the end of the financial year. Now, of course, we're getting to the end of the financial year, but that's still where there's finessing at that at the end of the year of a substantial multi-billion pound budget. 
would it? You know, if you're really committed to transparency, uh, as you've tried to reiterate in your answers to Mr Tomkins, would it not be better, as part of when you publish the draft budget, to also publish at that time what the underspend figures are uh, and also what the Scotland Reserve figure are, so that we, we, would then, we then all know what you're taking into these negotiations? Uh, just to double check, I think the Scotland Reserve figure is in the documentation. Um, it, so, 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 sorry, give me that. Annex A, Table 1, as far as I can see here, that the information is available. Yes, so that is in it. Now, in terms of budget exchange, um, that's a moving figure, so whatever I put in the draft budget will be a point in time. Now, as the <coughs> committee considers its approach on budget process uh, and financial planning, you know, there can be requests for updates, but this is a a moving position in terms of any underspend that might exist within the organisation? I, I accept it's a moving position, but um, at, at December you must have a, a forecast of what you think the underspend is going to be at the end of the year. And I think if that figure was available um, for all involved, then we'll get an idea of how much you might be looking to introduce at a further stage yeah, in the budget. Yeah. I, I suppose the point I'm trying to make that you can make a judgement at a point in time and at the point in time on the 14th of December, it set out the uh, potential use of budget exchange at that point. A, approximately 158 was in the budget. Now, the same table. which is in the same table. So the point I'm making is that figure will change until you get to the year end because you can't get expending exactly right. Now, of course, the important point here is to make sure that we can carry it forward. There are years in the past our carry forward was lost to Scotland, but we've been deploying it. The difference in the last couple of years is that we have been able to, yes, use it as part of budget negotiations and deploy it. And you could argue with the will of Parliament in advance as to how that's deployed, because it may have been deployed over the course of the next financial year previously. Just for clarity, so, so I'm absolutely sure of what we're talking about here. There is a table one, an annex to the, the, the draft budget document, which I think was submitted in December. Yes. And that f figure on, this, on the budget reserves for 2017-18 is 2003, and for 18-19 was 158. Yes. And uh, so that was, uh, and it was from these figures, that the, the, the amounts that you're talking about, the flip, requiring flexibility to finance the arrangements with the Greens is what you've taken the money from, or yeah. some of it. Eight. No, that was what was produced at that point in time as part of the budget. So that's the snapshot at that point in time of where the budget uh, exchange, uh, the budget uh, the underspend is expected to be at at that point. And that answers the question. And incidentally, I think that was an improvement from recommendations of previous years to put that table in to further explain in the draft budget as to how elements were being funded beyond the tax raising, revenue raising devices within the budget. So that's, a, that's actually an innovation to put that in. The point I'm trying to stress is that number changes because spending continues within Scottish Government. Yeah. Murdo, I think you had a question in this area as well. Yes, thanks, Commissioner. Um, just just so, so I get some clarity around this. The, the £110 million pounds extra that you've quoted from... Um, underspend and reserves. I think you said in reply to, to Adam Tompkins that you expect about 40 million of that would come from reserves. So we can assume that 70 million is coming from additional underspend. Is that is that uh, fair? Definitely, yes, yes. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, when you came to the committee on the 15th of January, when we met in Aberdeen, I, I asked you about the amount of money that was available uh, in the budget in this area. And you said in relation to this question of budget exchange reserve, which was stated at £158 million. Pounds. In the past, this is a direct quote from the official report, in the past, finance secretaries may have been able to hold on to that money for financial management reasons. For example, I have used the money up front for the purposes of budget negotiations. The figure is, is what it is because there is a very tight financial management and that is the figure that officials think is most appropriate. That was the 15th of January. When you presented your budget to Parliament on the 31st of January, which was 12 working days later, that figure of £158 million pounds had gone up by £110 million. That's a 70% increase in 12 working days. Is that reasonable? 
Yes, it is. And the reason for that, if you want a deeper understanding as to why some of these issues uh, emerge, is some of it's demand-led budgets, some of it's other factors out with our control. For example, Treasury issues or other elements of funding. So these figures can change. So it's not unreasonable for me to use the best information I've been given at the time to report to committee and then uh, take forward the budget. And this uh, will continue to be fluid until the end of the financial year. Cabinet Secretary, with, with respect, we're talking about a period of 12 working days for when you give evidence to this committee, trying to conduct uh, budget scrutiny, and then presenting your uh, budget bill to Parliament. Uh, do you not think it's holding this committee in contempt and the other committees of this Parliament in contempt, trying to commit uh, and carry out budget scrutiny when you're not uh, providing full information to the committees? Absolutely not. I'm, using, I'm sure the, the Tories are just using colourful language here when what I've done is to present the information that I have, the official fiscal position of the government, eh, in a, a transparent eh, and very productive way. Now, I'm happy if you want some official uh, engagement on this as well, in terms of why we arrive at the current uh, underspend figure, if you wish. Well, I wish. So let's, let's have it out and all the information we can just now. John? Yeah. I think, just going back to Mr um, Fraser's point, uh, what Ms Mackay was explaining at the committee on the 15th of January was the rationale and reasons for which he arrived at the 158 million underspend figure that was printed in the draft budget. So while um, the period between that being fixed and what we're talking about now is not 12 working days, but is... No, no, no. A longer no, 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 no. With, that. Hold, hold on. With, with, with respect, Mr. Nicholson. And I think the, the further point that Mr. Mackay um, put across was that in previous years, far less of the anticipated underspend had been allocated at the point of the draft budget, and more was then secured as part of any final budget deal. Whereas this year, we have secured more of the underpinnings of the draft budget from our anticipated position on underspend at draft budget stage. And the room for further you know, movements uh, since the draft budget was published is more restricted in this particular year. And as Mr Kelly pointed out earlier, we have reached an end position where we're in broadly an equivalent position to last year in terms of the overall quantum we're talking about. But the movement between the draft budget and the budget bill is far smaller than it has been in previous years because there's been less additional resource available to allocate. OK, I mean, thank you for that response. But just, I mean, just to be clear, Mr Nicholson, what I was asking Mr Mackay about on the 15th of January was not what was in the draft budget. I was asking quite specifically at that point, as you will see from the official report, was how much additional money might be available. So I was asking about the position as at 15th January, and so the, 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 the appropriate period is 12 working days. Yeah. That, that, to be clear, that would have been an accurate answer at that time. It's as simple as that. So, okay, we move on to a slightly different area now. Ash, I think you had some questions around health. Thank you, convener. Yes, um, obviously it's the largest portfolio, um, and but within it is an ongoing process of, I don't really like this word, but let's say modernisation and change. So um, there's a line in that budget, um, which is quite a big increase to the transformational change fund. So I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary thinks that that strikes the right balance within that portfolio in this sort of modernisation agenda and also how that money will be allocated? Yeah, that, that's a, I mean, a good question because funding of the NHS is, is significant and uh, important. There has been that real terms uplift uh, uh, and uh, that has been uh, welcomed. The Cabinet Secretary for Health is very clear that it's about investment and reform at the same time, or transformation, if you don't like the term modernisation, it's transformation at the same time uh, to try and uh, support the kind of changes that will help reduce demand, make the right interventions and be supportive around that transformation. Some of that might be around uh, better use of uh, technology and specific um, uh, uh, interventions around better performance of the figure it is a mixture of you know, that transformational uh, and reform funding amounts around uh, 126 million pounds and that will also support the regional uh, delivery plans uh, a once for Scotland uh, approach as I say those national improvements felt a more local level and um, supporting more sustainable models of care um, as well and I've touched on the digital capability so 
the health secretary is very clear with me that whilst there are increasing demands on the health service, it has to go hand in hand with that transformation uh, around a uh, better delivery of services and adapting services to be able to um, uh, respond to those pressures. In addition to that, of course, there, there's more around uh, mental health, and that's good for preventative uh, purposes, more around social care to try and support the, the infrastructure at a community uh, level uh, also, and uh, there's been good work around health and social care integration. And part of that package will support the territorial boards um, as well. So it is absolutely about delivering change and transformation, improved performance, at the same time as in investing uh, a well above inflation uh, amount. And I'd also like to ask you about the low carbon infrastructure. So as part of that, there's a £2 million rail development fund. Do you have any more details on what that might look like? Well, we're exploring that because one of the issues, although there is uh, a new stations fund and there is, uh, frankly, there's the ongoing um, issues with Treasury around the rail settlement um, to Scotland, but there's a, a need to support um, those who want to take forward feasibility studies and maybe get a sense of how they could progress the, the prospect of rail enhancements or rail stations in a local area. And there are people with particular expertise on that that we, we will engage with to make sure that, you know, that, that such a fund could be properly channelled. Um, not necessarily raising expectations that that means a new station might be coming down the line immediately, but it might be. Um, but it's to give the necessary support to take forward bids and um, the potential for that infrastructure to happen. And it was identified um, through the course of the negotiations, frankly, as an issue that should be explored, and that's what we're doing, and I've made a commitment to fund that. Thank you. OK, um, I think we're now getting to local government issues. Patrick? Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, in addition to the, uh, the low-carbon infrastructure investment and the... Uh, significant and welcome uh, shift of the, the government's position on public sector pay. Uh, local government was a, a significant focus of our uh, discussions and um, in the exchange of letters that's already in the public domain uh, between us, uh, it's very clear that uh, we were focused on achieving that uh, reversal of the, the cut that Spice had identified in the Scottish Government's funding to local government. Um, and that uh, we'd put significant options to you in, in the way that you, you did that. It is the Scottish Government's decision uh, to have funded that from, uh, or at least uh, partly from reserves and underspend rather than from additional tax changes. Uh, are you satisfied that that, uh, and bearing in mind the earlier discussion about uh, the, the importance of the reserve, are you satisfied that the tax changes uh, and the other changes that are necessary are adequate to fund that complete reversal in the 157 million cut that Spice has identified in local government funding? I don't agree with the terminology because, of course, we were giving more cash and there's a, dis a, a, a debate around, you know, which we've had at this committee about what should be included in the figures. But anyway, the extra 170 million, yes, I'm absolutely confident, will be provided for so much so when we move the, um, uh, the local government settlement order uh, and the redetermination, they, they get the money. So I, absolutely, I'm confident uh, of, of that uh, investment. Thank you about the local government finance order. You said in your opening statement you drew attention to the fact that uh, some of this overall £170 million package uh, is coming from uh, what would be an additional 2017-18 local government finance order. Uh, and uh, I'd like to know when you expect that to be laid when you expect that to be moved in Parliament and also and also just for the record uh, a clear confirmation that you have certainty that councils will be in a position to move that additional 1718 money into their budgets for 1819. Uh, yes, they absolutely can uh, carry it forward. There's, there's no uh, rigidity uh, around that. They've, they've uh, They've welcomed us, and on the redetermination order, it will be the 20th of January. 20th of February. Sorry, 20th of February, it will be... Um, it will be laid in Parliament. Yeah. So that would be laid before the Stage 3 yes. debate on the, on the budget itself. Yes. That's, that's helpful. You'll also be aware that we've uh, had correspondence from COSLA, who do welcome the, the progress that's been made on supporting local government. 
uh, but they've also drawn attention to the question uh, of whether that change will be baseline for the future. Now, that did ultimately happen to the, 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 the change to the previous year's budget. Um, but local government needs to have some degree of certainty for the future. Uh, they've, um, they've clearly said it's important for councils in setting the, the budgets to know whether or not this funding uh, is recurring. Uh, and uh, they've asked the committee to raise this issue with you. What's your response to them? Uh, I'll need to deal with that in the budget discussions in 1920. I haven't set any portfolio budgets beyond this financial year. Yes, there's project funding. Yes, there's multi-year commitments for elements such as housing, and that will come in childcare as well, city deals, so on and so forth. But I haven't set... Uh, I'm hoping to get the 1819 uh, budget through Parliament successfully. I haven't... Uh, I haven't proposed to set out the baselines for 1920. I wouldn't ordinarily do that. I'm not proposing uh, to do that because that would all be subject to discussion, budget preparation, negotiation for the next year. But I absolutely understand the point uh, that local government would want as much certainty as possible and would like it uh, to be a baseline, but I haven't set that degree of uh, certainty for any portfolio in Scottish government or part of a portfolio as that would be in uh, communities. That would be for the planning for the next uh, budget year. Obviously, the purpose of Scottish Government funding local government at all is to ensure that vital services can be delivered that people need uh, in, in every community in Scotland. And the, 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 the point of having debate and discussion on the level of that support uh, is to ensure that those services uh, can meet people's needs. Uh, even if you're not able to answer the question about baselining before uh, the, the stage three on the budget, Surely you would accept that local government will be in a far better position uh, to protect those services for the long term, for the future, uh, if you're able to give earlier clarity on this question this year than you did last year. It was, it was left until very late uh, in, in the, the current process uh, to confirm whether last year's changes were baselined. Surely this needs to be done much earlier uh, in the current process to give local government some clarity. It's a fair point, and, and I understand it, but it is the nature of the process and the timescales, which I know we've touched upon as well. Uh, we can do all the scenario planning, make all the assumptions we like, but it then uh, has the impact of the UK government uh, budget, and, and then, of course, what follows in terms of our own process. I get the point, though, around giving local government as much certainty as possible. That would apply to every part of government, though, I, I, would, I would say, in terms of delivering transformation as well. And the other unknown within that is the dynamic of what might be changing around provision of local services. So what I mean by that is take health and social care integration. If we make further progress on that, you don't know exactly what it means for financial formula either to local government eh, or, or to health. So I just make the point that I understand the need for greater certainty. I don't think local government minds that the extra £170 million pounds has come a, a wee bit late in the day. I think they welcome the £170 million, pounds, or certainly they have in the, in the correspondence and council uh, communications that I have uh, seen in terms of that extra resource. But I understand the point. But it does relate to uh, the nature um, a, of a, a, the relationship we, we still have a, in terms of fiscal policy in Scotland that, you know, a large chunk of the spending decisions that affect the country and therefore determine what we have is still made by a uh, treasury and still made by the chancellor and that then drives uh, uh, the time scales that, that we have got so i accept the point and um i mean i throw to to opposition parties as well the offer that if we were to have greater certainty at an earlier stage in the budget i would welcome that more than anyone i tell you but if we had certainty for from other parties, um, and that's certainly not a criticism of the Scottish Green Party, um, then maybe there can be earlier discussions on what the asks are and what outcomes might look like. But the only sense of delay now for the local government figure is that was clearly a point of negotiation and it improved to their uh, benefit. Just one, one brief final point. We've, we've just heard a, f a few minutes ago from the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, that if uh, the wider public sector is able to achieve uh, a similar pay policy uh, to the Scottish Government's pay policy, and in particular local government, uh, then that will increase the extra income tax revenue beyond the £7 million that they've already projected. What will you use that for? 
Well, I can say, Mr Harvey, that's the cheeriest news I've heard all day in watching the evidence from the fiscal... It wasn't F. C it wasn't F. Uh, earlier on, um, that uh, if they factor that in. Um, so that, of course, would be... Um, it's up to them to justify their forecast so, uh, and for local government to determine their pay policy, and I, I mustn't... Um, It'd be, it'd be reasonable if local government manages to achieve a, a, a more generous pay policy uh, that the extra income tax generated from that would benefit local government as well. Well, that's not a proposition I'm uh, making. I think they've benefited uh, very uh, well out of the govern government's uh, tax uh, policies and budget. I think Neil had some questions in this area. Right? Yes, thanks, Camina. Um, <clears throat> after the revised funding for councils agreed with the, the Scottish Greens, uh, many councils still believe they'll have to make significant cuts. Um, with the revised funding and with a 3% rise in council tax across the board, do you believe that councils have enough funds to avoid making further cuts over the next year? It, well, broadly, I think that that would leave them very well resourced indeed. It's an above inflation increase in the resources coming from the Scottish Government. Then, in addition to that, they can raise the council tax. So I think it puts local government in a very strong position, which is why COSLA has welcomed it, why a number of uh, uh, reasonable council leaders have, have welcomed it. And again, this is in the fiscal context of a reducing resource budget coming to Scotland that have reduced uh, front, front uh, line uh, uh, resources. Uh, we have been able to overturn that by using our tax uh, powers to invest in services, whether that's the NHS or education or the uplift in the economy brief. And now local government has above inflation increase in their settlement from Scottish government as well as all the other schemes that we're working in partnership uh, with, with local government on. So they'll be looking at expanding elements of service, uh, such as childcare, uh, such as the city deals investment, such as housing. These are multi hundreds of millions of pounds extra investment uh, to, to support local economies uh, and local services. And local authorities also have the ability to, to raise uh, the council tax. So yes, I do believe that it puts them in a very strong uh, financial position. And I know that some councils will have been consulting on what might have been seen as, as radical uh, options. Um, they do it every year. They did it when I was in local government. Sometimes it's officer-inspired as well. The elected members weren't necessarily ever going to choose those options, but they are presented. And it's good, as to, in a sense, that it has that transparency, that there's then dialogue and engagement and an understanding around that. And then invariably, every year, most of those decisions aren't made and aren't followed through. And I would argue that the settlement to local government uh, should, uh, should address a number of the concerns that Mr Bibby may have had. I'll just restate, I think many councillors are, are still saying they're going to have to make significant cuts um, over, over the coming uh, year. Over recent months, as you've said, we have had councils all across Scotland uh, publish plans for, for cuts. And you've said that was before the, the revised budget settlement. Um, as you know, in Renfrewshire, for example, uh, we've seen the prospect of day centre closures and proposals from the council to reduce grey bin collections, introduce parking charges and also plans to cut funding for family support services. Is it your position now that there is no financial necessity to make such cuts? Well, that would be me determining um, what uh, Remshire Council should do with the extra resources uh, it will have. Do, I'm asking well, you whether I think you think there's a financial... Mr. If you check the official report, that's exactly what you asked me to do. Whether there's a financial necessity to make such cuts. OK, I think you. the enhancement to the settlement should allow councils to revisit the necessity of uh, perceived or otherwise of some of the reductions that they might have been consulted on. So let's just uh, see how some of those proposals work out. But it's not for me to make those decisions. I'm no longer leader of Remshire Council, and Neil Bibby is no longer a member of that council, sparring with me there either. Ivan, I think you, issues around pay. Right. Yeah, thanks, convener, and um, welcome to the committee, Cabinet Secretary. Um, it was to talk around about the changes you've made to the public sector pay increase, and you've increased the level at which 3% would apply <laughs> up to, from 30,000 up to, I think, 36,500. Um, so it was really just to understand how many people you think are affected by that and what kinds of, um, of job roles are we we're talking about there? Uh, in terms of the, the figure, obviously, I mean, it helps with, with the, the whole spectrum, uh, the, the lower paid taken up to £36,500. <coughs> My understanding is it would, it would cover more um, teachers uh, and nurses. 
Um, mm. Recognising that teaching very specific, there's tripartite uh, negotiations around that. Sure. Um, a benefit a majority of the public sector workforce. And of course, we've touched on um, it, well, those under our control, but we've touched on how it's a benchmark. It's a mm. benchmark in health. And I've already said on the 14th of December that I would match anything that may come from the sure. UK wide um, review anyway for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, and local government in their discussions were expressing a view that they would feel the pressure or the expectation that they would want to match government policy entirely a matter for them. Uh, but of course, much of their workforce would be earning less than that figure of 36,500 as well. Um, so it covers a, a great deal of uh, public sector workers. It obviously, um, well, it has benefits to the government in terms of, of tax take. But, but the way we've done it in terms of capping at the top as well helps mm. tackle inequality yeah, of by capping the increase at £80,000 and doing what we're doing around the threshold of £36,500. Um, um, now, I know that there was some discussion earlier as to what government um, a pay policy covers. It might be helpful if I... Uh, supply the uh, policy paper that was announced on the 14th of December, although the numbers have changed, but to committee if that's helpful, so you know exactly who it covers. Okay. I saw some debate in that earlier yep. in your uh, earlier evidence session. Ivan, <laughs> Ivan, anything else? You, James, you've got a question still in this area. Yeah, okay. Just, uh, in terms of the funding that you announced last week, how much of it has specifically been allocated to cover the pay policy? Yeah, that, that's a fair enough question. I don't separate out pay as a specific part uh, of the Scottish budget. It's part of portfolio spending and part of the settlement to organisations. So it's deemed that organisations should follow the pay policy. That sets the parameters, but the funding is within the settlement. Bearing in mind that every portfolio, I think apart from uh, REC, has a real terms increase in the portfolio uh, lines. REC is quite different because it's not necessarily about um, resource spending. Some of that's a switch to capital as well. So there's satisfactory funding within the overall budget because we've used our tax powers, because we've made the investments to fund the pay policy. Um, pr prior to a, a following publication of the draft budget report, Space Analysis um, established that there was a £200 million shortfall in terms of what was in the budget and what was needed to cover the full extent of the pay policy. In addition to that, you've announced an extension to that policy uh, last week to cover those up to £36,500. I, I put it to you that the, the policy uh, is not fully funded in the budget. And I would simply reply uh, that it is in terms of the overall settlement to portfolios. I say all bar um, REC has had a real terms increase in their budget line. Um, and uh, there is a provision there to um, uh, to deliver that, and certainly, um, the, you know, cabinet is clear that the pay policy should be delivered. So I would argue that the resources there and the, the, the deal should be honoured. So just one final point in terms of what the, the extension of the policy last week that was announced. What is the additional costing of that, and how is it uh, how is it how is it budgeted for? Uh, the, that. Specific elements, £25 million pounds extra. Okay, and how's it budgeted for out of the £170 million? Pounds? Uh, it's, it's all part of the overall budget, as I've expressed. I don't separate out lines. It's all part of the uh, overall uh, settlement to portfolios to live within their settlement and deliver uh, the pay policy as outlined. It sounds to me as if you've uh, announced an additional £25 million pound commitment, but you haven't provided the, the funding for stakeholders and budget holders to be able to cover that? I, I'm simply trying to state, convener, that it's already within uh, the uh, settlement to portfolios. And if cabinet secretaries who lead departments and services felt that they couldn't deliver it, they would say so to me. And they haven't. It's an agreed position. They would deliver the pay policy and it's within the resources that have been set out, which is in the context, of course, of um, growing resources as a consequence of the decisions that the government has taken. Well, Willie, I may have missed out you earlier on. If I did, forgive me, but I think you've still got a question. Yeah, well, I just wanted to ask how you supplementary local government, Cabinet Secretary. Um, <coughs> uh, you've said it's an above inflation increase, of course, and, and from the figures that have been provided to us, I can see that East Ayrshire, certainly my authorities, due to gain another £3.6 million out of your, your amendments to the budget, which is very welcome. In, in that part of Ayrshire. Have you got any indication, Cabinet Secretary, as whether the 
other authorities are going to exercise their discretion on the 3% council tax power that they have, because we know last year that some, despite asking you to give them more money, refused to actually raise any more money locally themselves. And I think, if memory serves me correct, they were all Labour councils. Have you got any indication of whether all the councils will use the discretion this year or whether they're hedging their bets? It's a very good question, convener. Um, Mr Coffey's recollection is correct in terms of those who didn't use uh, the, their ability to raise the council tax last year. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it aligns with you know, electoral cycles, you know, I don't know, um, maybe. Uh, but I, I can't give a government a view. I can only tell you the intelligence I have is that um, most councils appear to be telling me that they are planning to use uh, that function um, and use uh, the ability to raise the council tax by up to 3%. It's entirely a matter for them uh, whether they do that or not, of course. Um, and we'll see how their budget cycles um, pan out in light of the extra resources that has been allocated to local government, which gives them a real terms increase in uh, resource uh, and capital, a substantial increase in capital. And you said COSLA has written and welcomed the proposals that you've made for the... Oh, on the uh, stage one budget debate, uh, a uh, press release was issued by COSLA, yes. Uh, don't get me wrong, local government will always ask for more money. I certainly would uh, when I was a council leader um, as well. Um, a, and they have recognised and given credit where it's due, their words, not mine, in terms of the extra resources that have been given. And then we engage on partnership on the areas of joint priorities and that which is important uh, to us all. Uh, but certainly they, uh, they have welcomed the extra resources, of course. Yep. Thank you. Neil, I think you had a question on child poverty. Yeah, it was just um, given the concerns that have been raised about child poverty during the uh, budget process, budget debate, is it still the case that the children's and family budget is, is, is facing a, uh, a reduction? I don't have that um, budget line uh, in front of me. Um, I can speak about the overall uh, approach, uh, as I did do at committee, on a range of interventions on equalities, on welfare, on social security, housing, the child poverty fund, the ending homelessness uh, together fund, the fact that the um, child poverty um, action plan uh, will be coming out as well this year, and then the, the, the new mechanisms we'll have with social security. So I, I don't have that uh, line in front of me. Now, um, the evidence session on budget at stage two. So we now turn to agenda item three which are the formal proceedings at stage two of the Budget Scotland Bill. Everyone should have a copy of the Bill as introduced, the Marshall List of Amendments that was published on Monday, and the grouping of amendments which sets out the amendments in order in which they will be debated. So we'll begin that process. The question is that section one be agreed, are we all agreed? We're agreed. I call Amendment one in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments two, three, four, five and six. Cabinet Secretary move and to speak to all amendments in the group. OK. The amendments 1 to 6 relate to authorisation to use resources that are provided for on Schedule 1 of the Bill and will adjust individual portfolio allocations within the Budget to reflect the spending announcements that were made at Stage 1 of the Budget Bill. Uh, amendment 1 adds £70,000 to the Health and Sport portfolio for the Scottish Sports Association. Amendment 2 allocates an additional £200,000 to accelerate the delivery of the four marine protected areas in the environment, climate change and land reform portfolio. Amend I'm talking through them all, can be done, yeah. Amendment 3 allocates an additional £10.5 million for funding of the inter-island ferries for the Orkney and Shetland Islands allocated as a specific grant to local government to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Portfolio. Amendment 4 allocates an additional £127 million to the Communities and Social Security Portfolio, £125 million for local government and £2 million for fuel poverty. Amendment 5 increases the total allocation of resources for the Scottish Administration by the net uplift of £137.77 million. And Amendment 6 increases the overall cash funding authorisation for the Scottish Administration under Section 4, Subsection 2 of the Bill by £137.77 million in line with the additional spending announced at Stage 1. And move the amendment. Amendment 1. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any other members wish to comment at this stage? James? Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, I wish to indicate support for the amendments that have been brought forward uh, on the basis that they do uh, introduce additional monies into the budget, uh, which is welcome. 
Um, however, in terms, I would say that in terms of the overall budget package, uh, I believe that it's still not fit for purpose. I think the discussions that we've had in the previous session around local government and, and pay uh, still illustrate that local government is underfunded, particularly on the back of £1.5 billion pounds of accumulated cuts since 2011. I don't think the pay intent announced by the Cabinet Secretary is transparent or fully funded, and I also believe that other areas of the budget, including the NHS and action to tackle child poverty, uh, don't go far enough. Uh, and therefore, although Scottish Labour will support these amendments in this group, uh, we don't support the overall approach to the budget and will continue to oppose it. Okay, Patrick. Thank you very much. Just to put on uh, record my support for these amendments, uh, I think it's very positive that we have, for a second year in a row, managed to prevent additional cuts to uh, core funding for, for local government. However, I'd say James Kelly makes a fair point that local government has, in previous years, suffered uh, significant cuts, uh, and we've not yet repaired the past damage. Uh, and I sincerely hope that this is the last time that the Scottish Government's budget process uh, ends up as a rearguard action against local government cuts. We need to ensure that local government in the future is in a far stronger position to make its own financial decisions, uh, and I hope that's a discussion that the Scottish Government engages in positively over the, uh, the months ahead. Any other comments? Okay, Cabinet Secretary, you want to wind up? I'll just conclude by saying that the amendments reflect the announcements at stage one appreciate the engagement of um, uh, the committee. Um, the, since it's been raised, the, the settlement to local government is, you know, I reiterate, a real terms increase for local government even before they have the option of deploying their council tax powers. Um, the settlement has been very well received uh, and uh, the other uh, amendments reflect uh, the, the constructive deal that's been done with the Scottish Green Party. And I would encourage all political parties, including the Labour Party, to engage more constructively in future if they want to help shape future budgets. OK, that means the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendments 2, 3, 4 and 5, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 2 to 5 on block. Move. Uh, and ask any member if they object to a single question being put on amendments 2 to 5 on block. There is no objection being notified. Um, the question is that then amendments 2 to 5 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that section 2, schedule 2, section 3 and sh schedule 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Call amendment in the Six, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. I move. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed, or are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that Section 4 be agreed, or are we all agreed? Yes, We're agreed. The question is that Section 5 to 11 be agreed, or are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed, or are we all agreed? That concludes um, stage two of the, the budget bill. I now suspend for five minutes just to allow changeover of witnesses, etc.
Okay, the final piece of business on our agenda today is to take Evans on the Lands and Buildings Transaction Tax Relief from Additional Amount, Scotland Bill at Stage 1, from Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution. The Cabinet Secretary is joined by officials Ewan Cameron Nielsen from the Finance Directorate and John St Clair, the Senior Principal Legal Officer in the Scottish Government. Members have received copies of all the written evidence received, along with a spice briefing. But before we go to questions, I invite the, the Cabinet Secretary to make, oh, make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. This bill aims to give retrospective effect to an order considered by this committee in June 2017. That order in this bill considers the treatment of economic units. That is a term given to married couples, several partners and cohabitants, those living as if married couple, and the Land and Transaction Tax Amendment Act 2016. In 2016, the additional dwelling supplement, a 3% tax additional rate of tax, was introduced. This applies where, at the end of the day, there is the effective date of a transaction, a buyer owns more than one dwelling, and the buyer is not replacing a main residence. The re replacing a main residence in context of the legislation means selling the previous main residence and buying a new main residence. It is the Scottish Government's intention that when the additional dwelling supplement is paid, it can be reclaimed when a main residence is being replaced and the sale of the previous main residence occurs within 18 months of the purchase of what then becomes the current main residence. As the ADS has been in operation, it has become clear that in practice the legislation has not worked as it was intended to in relation to economic units and the ability to reclaim the tax paid after a former main residence has been sold. This has been corrected for all transactions occurring after the order came into force in June 2017. Members of this committee and stakeholders highlighted a desire to secure retrospectivity of this relief to the qualifying couples. The Scottish Government agrees with this view and it is therefore bringing forward primary legislation for your consideration to enable this relief to apply retrospectively. This would mean that qualifying buyers could claim a repayment of the ADS in instances where they had to pay the additional amount despite disposing of the previous main residence in 18 months prior to the effective date or they would not otherwise have been able to reclaim the additional amount after disposing of their previous main residence in the 18 months after the effective date. And I look forward to hearing committee's views on this matter. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think Ivan McKee would got a question about groups. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Convener, and, um, and, and welcome again, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, you, you'll have seen from some of the submissions we received that there were some comments, the Law Society and others, around about um, other changes that they they wish to see to the to the the, the, the LBTT uh, tax regime, and also some comments on the process whereby Revenue Scotland and the government interacted and were involved um, in, in in reviewing and making minor changes as required. I don't know if you'd, any, if you'd had a chance to look at those and if you had any comments on any of those areas. I am aware of, of some of those issues, but I just want to be really clear that this bill, the, the scope of the bill, is really tight to just give effect to that which we know we need to fix. And that's why the, the scope is tight, the purpose is clear, and that's what I want to achieve. Other people have then engaged on other matters in relation to land and building transaction tax. Um, there are wider issues. It would, be, it would be nice to have a kind of a finance bill that exists in, in Westminster to be able to do a lot of tidying up uh, exercises where there might be unintended consequences, anomalies, or, or, or refinement that might be required. And I think that that would be a great place for that that kind of issue in future. But in relation to to issues such as as, as the group uh, shares a uh, issue and some other matters, um, it's not part of this bill. On that very specific issue, I think I have a remedy that helps with it, but I'll write to the committee before I announce anything uh, and won't uh, you know, prejudice or preview that now. So there are other matters, but they're not relevant to the, the purpose of this piece of legislation. But I will uh, reconsider in light of uh, engagement uh, through the course of the yeah, last thanks few very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I should remind members of my interest. I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland. Um, can I just, um, before I ask my question, uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for bringing this forward. He, he will recall I wrote to him on this issue some time ago, raising an issue with constituents uh, who were caught uh, by this particular loophole. And um, I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary has acted to try and... Uh, find what we can do when we work together, Isn't it marvellous? <laughs> It's not marvellous. We should do more of it, Captain. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, the question I was going to ask um, was in relation to um, a comment made by the Law Society in their uh, evidence that they have uh, submitted to uh, the committee, 
Um, they welcome the, the bill uh, as it's brought forward. Uh, the, the point they make, which I think is quite a, a, an important one, is that this measure is one that will require to be given wide publicity uh, once the legislation is enacted to ensure that taxpayers who have been caught out are aware of the change in the law and if they have paid ADS are able to um, reclaim that. So c can you tell us, um, Cabinet Secretary, what um, proposal the Scottish Government have to, to publicise this legislation, assuming Parliament enacts it? I'm not sure a mass publicity campaign is the most proportionate or effective or targeted intervention here, whereas uh, Revenue Scotland will have a very clear function. They have been aware of uh, our desire to, to remedy this. So I think we'll engage with Revenue Scotland to go back through and see how they, they approach it. I'm happy to write to the, or have Revenue, it's not for me, but have Revenue Scotland engage with the committee. You know, if the legislation's uh, successfully passed, how they'll then um, uh, contact people to ensure they're entitled to, uh, to reclaim it. And I'm sure um, constituency members will also get back positively to cases that have been um, raised. We have estimates of cost and we have estimates of how many people um, it should affect. That's all in the financial memorandum. So I think trying to identify them is, is uh, a fair point. All the transactions are done by solicitors and it will be cascaded mm -hmm. down to solicitors. Yeah. Uh, and in any event, um, uh, the, 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 the legal world will be well aware um, of this. So it will raise publicity. But, but I think uh, it's a good question for Revenue Scotland. Yeah. I think you still had another quick question. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it was just uh, for the sake of completeness um, and on the record to remind the committee to refer to my register of interests with respect to residential property. I have nobody else has identified that they wish to ask a question at this stage. Uh, the, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The, the clerks will now produce a, a report for this stage one process. And I close this particular meeting um, of the Finance Committee.